Hello, church family. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to look at um, the book of Romans today, uh, Romans chapter 7, but we're going to start off with uh, a little review of Romans chapter 6 because uh, Romans 6, the, the key point, if you listen to our study last time, you'll remember that the key point is that we, as when we accept Christ as our Savior, we're dead to sin. And we talked about this uh, diagram here, which uh, the, the end is sin, and we, we often think about the fact that we're tempted to sin, and that's how sin happens. The devil comes and tempts us. But we also talked about the fact that deep down inside there's a desire for whatever it is that we are tempted to do, and the desire comes because we, we don't have something that we think we need or want. And... It's, it's interesting, today's uh, chapter 7, Paul's going to talk about this too. He's, in fact, he's going to talk about sin in a slightly different way. And so the ultimate, of course, reason that we're tempted to sin is because we don't trust God for some area of our life, and then we have this thing we want or think we need, in which case we have this deep desire, and then temptation comes in and swoops us up, sort of, and then we end up in sin. And so... We're going to talk about how that works because Paul struggled with that even after he was a missionary for 25 years. And so chapter 7 is an extraordinarily positive, very encouraging chapter. Maybe one of the most encouraging chapters in all of the scripture. And so chapter 6 talks about the fact that we're dead to sin. Chapter 7 talks about the fact that we're dead to the law. Now we would understand that more if we were Jewish and had grown up with the law, but Paul is going to discuss it here in this chapter, and we'll try to make it clear to us because we haven't ever really thought much about being captive to the law, you know, that God gave the Jews. And then when we get to chapter 8, it's it, we're, we're not dead anymore. We're alive to the Spirit or to God, and it's another uh, very um, uh, encouraging chapter. So, I don't know. Have you ever wondered... Why, after you became a Christian, you still struggle with sin and temptation? They still come around. Uh, sometimes you wonder, why don't I love God more? Why don't I want to pray more? Why don't I want to share God's love more? I mean, why is it that my life is not nearly like I dreamed it would be when I accepted Christ as my Savior? And so Paul asks himself these questions, and he's answering them here in chapter 7. So before we actually get into the, the scripture passage, I need to tell you a couple of stories because they will illustrate some of the truths in this chapter. So the first story that I want to tell you is uh, uh, one uh, that Max Lucado told on himself, and it's in his book uh, on Romans. And uh, he, he talks about the fact that on, on his way to work every day, he would come up to uh, a stop sign and there'd be lots of cars and it would take them 5, 10, 15 minutes sometimes just to get through that stop sign and it frustrated him to no end, kind of like it used to be here on Coronado and Golf Links, you know, there used to be giant cars when school was just started. And so he got frustrated and so he started looking around and three or four blocks before he got to that, that stop sign, he noticed that there was a street that went off to the left that went exactly where he thought he wanted to end up. And so on this day, he made a quick left turn, and it was uh, uh, kind of an alley behind a shopping center. And he drove back behind the shopping center, and it came out right over on this, and he missed the whole stop sign thing. And so he was extremely proud of himself. And so he, every day, he did this thing, and he saved himself 10, 15 minutes every day. And then one day, he was on his way to work, and his wife was with him, and he was sort of bragging. He was saying things like, I'm going to show you now why you made such a good decision to marry me. And I've made good decisions. And so he makes this left turn uh, back behind the shopping center. And after they're out on the other side, he said, so what do you think about this, this saving uh, all this time? And she said, well, you were breaking the law. You were driving the wrong way on a one-way street. And he said, no, I wasn't. And she said, sure you were. You, there was a sign that said that right there. And so to prove her wrong, of course, he drove around and looked, and there was a sign that said, do not enter one way. 
that caused him some great distress because now he wanted to, to save that time. He even thought about it. Every time he drove by that, that street, he would think about it and he'd make promises to God like, God, if I can just save these five minutes, even though I'm breaking the law, I'll use it in prayer or I'll use it in Bible study or something like that. But it's, he couldn't do it because he realized that he was breaking the law. And so um, this, this caused him some distress. And so Paul had a similar illus, il, illustration of this in his life that we'll talk about in just a minute. Well, it's, all, it's very much like when you have kids or grandkids and they come over, you have cookies in a cookie jar and you say, you may not have any cookies. And so what is it that those kids want more than anything else in the entire world? They would rather have cookies than anything. And when they climb up on the counter and get cookies, they don't just take one. They take seven or eight or ten because it has become such a big desire in their life for these cookies. And that's the way Paul says that's what the law does for us. And then there's uh, another story that I... That, you, you know this story, the basic idea. It's the story of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Robert Louis Stevenson wrote, wrote this. And uh, I'm told that he was a Christian when, when he was uh, thinking about this. And he was thinking about the very same thing when he wrote this story as Paul did was thinking about when he wrote uh, Romans 11. And so it's a classic story. And you know what a classic story is. It's a story that... Uh, everybody knows about, but nobody's ever read. Well, maybe you've never read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but you know the idea that Dr. Jekyll was a good man, and he uh, uh, discovered that there was this part inside him that kept his good part from doing good things all the time. It always wanted to do bad things, and so he invented this potion, and when he took it, the, it kept the, the bad part of his life, who he named Mr. Hyde, and it comes from words that mean hide or hideous or something like that. And he, he fixed it so that Mr. Hyde would only come out at night. But when he came out, he did many extraordinarily evil things, including killing people. And so he, the thing that surprised him the most, he said as he was talking through his character, Dr. Jekyll, was how evil that other part of him was. And so he was uh, contemplating how to deal with these two parts of him, Dr. Jekyll part, which was the good part, and Mr. Hyde, who was the bad part. And Paul struggled with exactly the same thing in this chapter, and he's talking about how he did it. Now, Paul also talks about sin in an interesting sort of way. I mean, he doesn't describe it, but this is the way he's talking about it. It's not He's not talking about individual sins that we commit, you know, uh, stealing or lying or something, although those are part of it. But he's talking about the this whole concept of sin and evil that each one of us have. We have this sin nature inside us. And it's 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 like I talked about briefly in when we talked about chapter six. It's like in the uh, Lord of the Rings, the ring was sort of represents sin as I as I see it. And so I just want I want to show you a little clip in a minute, but I want to set the stage for that clip. And it's uh, Frodo is the the one who has been assigned the task of taking the ring out of the Shire because they didn't want all the evil stuff to come to the Shire. And so they they went and did all kinds of things and they finally uh, ended up at a place where they were deciding who's going to take this ring and destroy it because it needs to be destroyed. Otherwise, it will take over and make evil everywhere and evil will be the only thing left. And so Frodo, not quite realizing how evil sin was, just said, I'll do it. And then eight of his friends went along with him and uh, decided to help him. And so it was the Fellowship of the Ring and they were going on this journey and they came to a particular spot where one of the people on his team was taken in by the ring and wanted that ring. He wanted the power that that ring would give him. And in fact, he almost stole the ring from Frodo and in fact ended up dying because he uh, had fallen slave to what, what this ring could do. And it's at that moment after this man has died and Frodo has realized 
what evil the ring is and this is and this is what he does right here take a look I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. So what, what Frodo did, I mean, he, he didn't want the ring, but the advice was you have, when you discover that you have it, you have to decide what you're going to do with that moment. And he decided that he had to go do something to get rid of that ring, and he was going to go all by himself because he didn't want to risk the lives of the others who were with him. And so he made a decision to, to do something. And, and that's one of the things Paul is telling us in this passage is when we discover that we have this uh, sin nature in us and it's still with us, we have to make a decision what we're going to do. And he made the decision. He's going to tell us what that is too. Then just one more thing before we uh, look at the scripture. Paul, all through this passage, I mean, maybe 15 or 20 times, he uses the word I, the personal pronoun I. He's talking about himself. He's talking about how he felt about this and how, what happened to him and how things worked out so that he came to this truth. And so as we look through the scriptures, I want you to notice all the places where Paul is talking about himself. He's giving us a personal testimony, basically. And so we'll talk about what, he's, what he means in each of those instances when he talks about himself. So I say, let's take a look at the scripture and see what Paul has to tell us. Okay, so let's look at the uh, verses that Paul wrote in uh, uh, the seventh chapter of Romans. If you've got your study guide, um, a lot of what, what I'm going to say is there. It'll give you a place to take notes. So um, th this is an interesting way that Paul uses to describe what's, what's about to happen. Paul does that pretty often. He often says, okay, here's the truth, and then he uh, describes how that truth is supposed to work. And that's and this is the, the truth part. And then he's going to describe how it works in the following verses. So here's how he starts. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. And so he's talking to not only Jewish people who know the law, but it's mostly the Jewish people that he's talking to here because they're the ones who are tied to the law and think, I have to keep obeying the law. It's the only way that I can actually get to heaven is if I obey the law. And he goes on. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. And so he's, he's, he's personifying the law as her husband. And so if, if you're married to somebody... Paul's saying God expects you to stay married uh, un until that person dies or until you die. In verse 3, so then if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So death in this case is, is freeing her from these responsibilities that she had before, just like it is with the law. I mean, if, and Paul is saying that we not only died to sin, but we died to the law. When we accepted Christ as our Savior, 
He died on the cross. We died on the cross with him, not only to sin, but to the law. And then in verse 4, So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him, that's Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. See, the whole reason that God invites us to accept him as our, his, his son as our personal savior, the whole reason is he wants us to bear fruit for him. And there's all kinds of fruit. I mean, I'm pretty sure he means fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, those things. But he also means some other kinds of fruit, actually some actions on our part, actions that show that we are part of God's kingdom and that we're different than the average person. And so then in verse 5, he goes on. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore the fruit of death. And so Paul is suggesting here that when, when we're trying to, to uh, please God by obeying the law, all we get is death. We don't, we don't get life. And I think he means that the law is any standard that we might choose um, that, to prove our worth or to gain acceptance. And so it could be how you establish your identity with, with your worth. Am I a good enough Christian? Am I doing enough good things to please God and, and make other people think that I'm a good Christian? Or am I a good enough student by doing all the right things so that I, I will get the scholarships? Or do, do I have enough talent or have I worked hard enough? Am I a good enough mother? I mean, we, we put laws on ourselves. We make laws for ourselves. And these kinds of laws, if we, if we decide that those are the things that we have to do to please God, then we're, we're still married to the law. Because God says we, don't, we die to the law. We don't have to have that. And so... Before you were a Christian, post-Christ, B.C., you, die, you died to the law when you accepted Christ, and now you're married to him, Jesus Christ, not to the law anymore. And so he goes on to uh, talk about here that for when we were in the realm of the flesh, that's before we were a Christian, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us. And it's those sinful passions that are, that are aroused by the law. It's things that we wouldn't even think about doing, maybe, except the law says don't do this, and so it's like the cookie jar. We don't, may not even be thinking about the cookie jar, but when somebody says you can't have any cookies, what's the one thing that sticks in your mind? You have to have those things. And so what, what he's saying is the law arouses us to do wrong things. And that's not the exact intention of the law, but it is what what it does and so and then in verse 6 he says but now by dying to what once bound us we've been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code and so because we have accepted christ as our savior we we don't have to try to obey the law anymore what we do is we trust in jesus because he loved us and invited us to become a part of his forever family. So now let's look at the next few verses in, uh, in this story. So here we are in uh, verse 7, and somebody has labeled this part of this chapter, the battle that we can't win. And, and I, I, I think that's not a bad title. So let's look at what Paul is saying here. Verse 7, he says, what should we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not, he says. Now, Paul does this all through this book. He, he makes some statements about truth, and then he asks questions that he thinks his Jewish friends might be asking because he's sort of taken pokes at the law and what they believe and what they do. And so he, he's asking this rhetorical question that a Jewish person might ask, and he says, and, and their question would be, say, is the law, I mean, you're talking about the law, is it that bad? Is it sinful? And he's saying, certainly not. But he goes on, nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. See, that's the purpose of the law. It tells us what sin is. And before the law, we, we weren't feeling guilty about much. But after the law came, and, and here in this particular passage, when he's talking about the law, 
he's really talking about the summary of the law, which is the Ten Commandments. And uh, he, he's, he's saying that he wouldn't have known what sin was unless the law came along. Unless somebody tells you this is wrong, then you don't know that it's wrong. And, and so, he, but he goes on, For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. Now, this is an interesting spot here because the Ten Commandments, I mean, if you remember them, they're, they're actions. They're things that we do. Uh, love God with all your heart. Uh, no idols. Uh, honor your parents. Do not steal. Do not uh, tell false stories. Uh, do not commit adultery. I mean, th these are all actions that we're not supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, number 10 comes up, and it's not an action. It's something that goes on in our heart called coveting. And Paul seems to think that God put this one last because it's the most important one, and it gets to the root of the issues. And, and Martin Luther pointed out that this, this particular commandment, thou shalt not covet, is the basis for all the other commandments. It, we do all the other things that are commanded against in the Ten Commandments because of this one, because we covet something in our heart. So why do we steal? Well, we covet or desire what somebody else has. Or why do we tell a lie? Well, because we want something that we can't get by telling the truth. We exaggerate our accomplishments to obtain a position, perhaps, or we tell a lie to be able to get this thing or get somebody to do something that we want. Why do we commit adultery? Well, we covet sex with somebody God hasn't given to us. And the real twist is, Paul started to realize that his zeal in religion was fueled by his covetousness. He made he, he, all the things he did to be zealous as a Jewish person had to do with coveting either position or status or respect or distinction among others. He wanted to be the best, the biggest, the most important. And so this is one of the primary motivators for sin in our life is coveting what somebody else has. And he's saying that it made him feel like he was dead. So let's read on. Verse 8, But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, that's the commandment, do not covet, produced in me every kind of coveting, just like the cookie jar. But when you realize that you're not supposed to do this thing, it spurs us on to doing more. And the thing the way it gets spurred on is our uh, old sin nature inside us wants those things. It spurs that old nature on to want that and figure out ways to get what they want, what it wants. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So <laughs> it's like he said in Romans 6. If you're, not, if you're not worried about the law, if you're not concerned about that, then you're, you're dead to sin. That's what happened when we died with Christ. Once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. Before this commandment became obvious to him, he didn't worry about the other nine commandments because he wasn't doing them. He felt like he was, he was doing fine. He was going along just fine. And most people think that this is happening to him when he's a young a young person, maybe a child, maybe a teenager. Uh, it, it's hard to tell, but when he realized that coveting, which is something we do in our heart, was a sin, that's when he died. He felt like he was dead. It was before he was a Christian. He didn't know that he, that what Christ could do. And so he just felt like he was dead and it just destroyed him. And so he worked harder and harder and harder to get the things that he wanted. And so in verse 10, he goes on. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. See, that commandment, thou shalt not covet, is intended to bring life because if we don't covet, then we don't do all the other, we don't break the other commandments. And so it brings life to us. 
because we don't have to worry about having committed sin because we haven't committed any sin. But when you covet things, then you start figuring out ways to get them, and they have to they come by sin because if God wants us to have them, he will give them to us. And so verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, do not covet, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. Now, I find this extraordinarily interesting because he's talking about sin here. He's talking about sin like it's a person. It's not a person, but it works. It's like the ring in Lord of the Rings. It's, it, it changes people. The, the longer they, Frodo kept that ring, the more it changed him. And when other people saw it, it changed them. And that's what sin does. It changes us. It moves us. It it tries to motivate us to do to get what it wants, which is always getting things around God, not allowing God to give them to us. And so that commandment put him to death because he realized he had no hope of ever obeying all the law so he could be at peace with God. He, he, when he realized that, he felt like he died. And then verse 12, so then, he's saying, the law is holy. Hmm, interesting. And the commandment is holy, the one about coveting, righteous and good. So the law is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. See, God wanted us to realize how evil and bad and terrible sin actually is. And so when, when he gave us the law, it made us want those things, and we began to see, just like Frodo began seeing how evil that ring turned him and how uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he realized how evil that evil thing was. Until then, he didn't, we didn't realize how evil it was. But because God gave us the law, it showed us how evil it is and we should decide we can't possibly want that in our life. What we should want is what God wants to give us because what he gives us every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights he only gives us good things and sin only brings us bad things so let's move on and and see what he says in the rest of this chapter because he gives us some answers so in this part of romans paul uh, is talking about he's moving from his pre-christ days to his mature Christian days. And somebody has labeled this part of Romans the battle that we can't lose. And so let's just look at some of the things Paul says because he's looking at it from his perspective of having become a Christian and been a Christian uh, all these many years. So he starts out, uh, we know that the law is spiritual. So he said that in the, in the last verse or two that we just read. He, he's not suggesting that the law is bad. Or, or that it's unspiritual, or that it tempts us to sin, or anything like that. He's saying the law is spiritual, and he realizes what Jesus said, that until the end of time, the law is not going to change. There's not going to be one jot or tittle that's going to change the law. So, And it's spiritual, but, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now, how is that possible? How, how is it that you can be a slave to sin? Sin is not something that you can put your fingers on, but it is something that works inside us. It's already in us. It's like that Mr. Hyde in the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story. It's, it's inside us, and it's always trying to get out and always trying to, to do what it wants. It always wants um, what it wants. It's selfish, always thinking about itself, always desiring pleasure and, and all of those kind of things. And so Paul goes on in verse 15. I do not understand what I do. He's a Christian now, and he's not always doing the Christ-like things. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Sound familiar? That's what happens to us too, right? 
Verse 16, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good because the law tells us that sin is bad. And when we, when we do things that we, we know are sinful, it's showing that the law is actually good, that it's spiritual, that it's doing its job. And then in verse 17, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Now this is an interesting concept. He is suggesting, although he's not saying that he's not responsible for what he does, but he is saying that sin is always working inside of me. And when I go for those things that my sin nature wants, it, I am allowing it to take control of me. I'm, I'm pursuing that. I'm in, and it's always tempting me, always pushing me to go that direction. And he's, and he's saying, it's not I that want to do it. I don't really want to do that. But it pushes me and I sometimes let it win. And then in uh, verse 19, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Sin living in us causes us to do all kinds of things. It's even though there's a new you, the Holy Spirit is living in you. But that, this is a pretty powerful thing. It's been there since we were born and it has a lot of habits and it wants to keep on doing those things and to turn it around. It will never make it stop. All we can do is decide who we're going to be married to. Are we going to be married to Christ or are we going to be married to our sin nature? It's a little like <clears throat> the story that I heard about the end of World War II. When the Allied uh, forces uh, took over Berlin, uh, the capital had been taken, all the, main, the leaders had been taken into custody, uh, the enemy forces were put away, except there were still a few soldiers hidden in all different kinds of places around Germany who either didn't know the war was over or decided that it wasn't over for them. And so they kept on fighting and they had to find all of those soldiers and take them out before the war would really be over. And it's a little like that inside us. There are still some soldiers that are part of our sin nature that are not willing to give up. They want to keep on doing what they want to do. And in verse 18, it says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature or my flesh. There's no good that dwells in my flesh. It's only evil. It's only controlled by sin. And our worst desires have nothing to do with the cravings of our physical body oftentimes. I mean, most of the, uh, many of the Ten Commandments have to do with cravings of our physical body that we want, but the cravings that are in our sin nature are things like pride and hatred, unforgiveness. See, those don't have to do with physical things. They have to do with sins of the spirit. They're part of our inside. And when he's talking about our flesh having no good in it, that's true. And, and our flesh includes all of us except for Jesus. All of us except for where Jesus lives. And so apart from Jesus, how much good is there in our flesh? None. There is no good. And so Paul is saying, I have both natures living in me. And there's the new one because I was saved by Christ and I was resurrected with him. And he's the guy who wants to please God. There is that guy in me. But there's the flesh, the guy who doesn't ever want to do what's right. He wants to please himself. It's a little like going to a football game, a U of A alumni and an ASU alumni, and they're playing each other and they're sitting next to each other. And they don't want to look at each other. They cheer at different times. They jeer at each other. And they have secret fantasizing about when the other's demise might ultimately come. I mean, that's the way it, it is. These, these two things inside us just won't cooperate with each other. In fact, it's a lot like preschool. Because there's a certain time when a preschooler begins using the word no, 
and there is nothing you can do to make them say, yes, I want to do that. They want, they no, no, I don't want that. I want this. I want this. I want this. And that's the way our sin nature is. So let's read on. Verse 20. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. It's the sin that motivates me to do things that I don't want to do. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. <laughs> and see, because of our new nature, because the Holy Spirit's living in us, we want to do good. We want to spend time praying and reading God's Word and, and uh, helping other people and doing the things that God has called us to do, loving others. But evil is right there with me, trying to get me not to do it, always wanting to do the opposite. Verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. That my inner being is where the Holy Spirit lives. And, the, and we delight in God's law. We delight in doing what God wants because he showed his love for us. And we want to show love back. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. There is this thing that always wants to make me a prisoner to sin. That's what it wants. It wants to make me its prisoner so it can do whatever it wants. And then in verse 24, what a wretched man that I am. Have you ever thought that? I mean, P Paul is expressing what every Christian I've ever talked to realized. I'm a wretched man or woman because I want to do this other thing, but I'm not doing it. I, it's like I, I just can't hardly do it. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then comes his extraordinary answer, verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. See, it is true that we are in our mind in a slave to God's law because the Holy Spirit lives there. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to transform our mind and rework our thinking, we become more and more like Christ. That's the idea. It doesn't happen overnight, although we wish it would. But it's an ongoing thing. And it's interesting, the, the farther we go in our Christian life, the less these sinful things please us. And so we, we decide to throw that away because we would rather have the pleasures that God gives rather than the ones that sin give. And we become more and more like him if we allow him to change our minds, to change our thinking. So I have a couple of insights for us. Number one, believers have a constant war going on inside of them. We do, don't we? And Paul summarized this, this whole concept in Romans 7, in Galatians 5, 17, where he said, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. And then in Colossians 3, he says, Put off the old self with its practices, and put on the new self. That's what God wants us to do. And so the old self doesn't go away, but in your heart, there is a new nature. It is the Holy Spirit who's living there. And the old nature is there too. It's just like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, when he was talking about that. It, they're still there and there's a fight that goes on, but we need to allow the Holy Spirit to renew our mind, to change our thinking, to transform our thinking so that we love the same things that God loves. And then uh, insight number two, knowing that I have ultimate victory changes my disposition in the fight. We do have ultimate victory. I have read Revelation. I know how it's going to turn out at the end. And so we have this ultimate victory, but it doesn't seem like we're victorious at the moment. So I know my sinful cravings are not the true me anymore. The true me is what Christ is doing in me and changing me to be like. My sinful nature is not the real me anymore. That's really dead. And 
it may be that in your old life, you had this sinful habit and then you would do it and then you would try to get, get over it and beat yourself up and fall back into it again. And then you became a Christian and it still keeps happening. But you still feel like you're in a battle that you can't win, but that's wrong. You're now in a battle you can't lose. But the ultimate outcome is determined because God is going to win. We are on the winning side. And sin doesn't satisfy me like it used to. And so it's a little like the man who, before he was a Christian, would go to oh, seminars around the country. And at each one of those, he might find uh, another woman to have a relationship with other than his wife because his wife wasn't there. And so he became a Christian and he went to a seminar in a similar city. And one of the women that he had this relationship with came up to me and said to him and said, hey, uh, remember me? And, and he said, no, I'm not sure. And she said, yeah, yeah. And she told him about it. And finally he said, yes, I remember you and wh who you are, but I'm not the same me. And so he was able to leave. He was able to not have another relationship with her. That's the way our Christian life is. I can be confident even in the most discouraging of seasons because Satan always wants to accuse us when we fall for sin. When we allow our sin nature to lead us into temptation and, and out into doing wrong things, Satan wants to come and accuse us and say things like, you'll never be a Christian, you'll never be that good, God can't possibly, use, and all kinds of other thoughts will come to our mind. But it's not true. They're lies. All Satan does is lie. But here is an interesting story that I hadn't heard before. It's, uh, it happened in December 1941, and it was on uh, December the 7th, on that Sunday, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and um, uh, FDR did what he did that day. But on that day, uh, Winston Churchill, after he heard about this, called FDR and said, I'm sorry about what happened. And FDR told him, well, we are all in the same boat now. And this is what, what Winston Churchill wrote in his memoir, in his diary that day. No American will think it wrong of me to proclaim that hearing the U.S. was on our side was the greatest joy to me. England would live. Britain would live. The rest of the war was simply proper application of overwhelming force. I went to bed and slept the sleep of, of the saved and the thankful. Overwhelming force was all that he needed. And when we came into the war, he realized he was going to have that. The Holy Spirit is our overwhelming force. His president, presence in us assures us a victory. And it may look like the Nazis are winning even in our heart, but defeat is assured. Their defeat will be assured because God is going to win. It's not that I want to do good, but get tripped up. I don't even want to do good sometimes. Sometimes my wanter is broken. But I've made a decision to seek God. I want to change, and I want God to change me. And that's what Paul decided too when he said, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Seminary can't. College can't. Riches can't, power can't, nothing can. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know God uses an ongoing struggle to grow my appreciation of his grace. That's one of the reasons I think he lets some of these things continue in us. C.S. Lewis said, Sometimes God leaves smaller sins intact to keep us from the bigger one, pride. Pride is the main sin. And if we don't keep pride from becoming a part of our life, sin will take over in our life. So who are you married to? I'm, I'm always interested in thinking about that, and it's a decision that we have to make. And Pastor Mark read a great article on Sunday, this past Sunday, it was Dr. Ray Ortland who wrote, Who Are You Married To? And in it, here's what he said. 
We were married to Mr. Law. He was a good man in his way, but he, but he did not understand our weakness. He came home every evening and asked, so how was your day? Did you do what I told you to do? Did you make the kids behave? Did you waste any time? Did you complete everything I put on your to-do list? So many demands and expectations, and hard as we tried, we couldn't be perfect. We could never satisfy him. We forgot things that were important to him. We let the children misbehave. We failed in other ways. It was a miserable marriage because Mr. Law always pointed out our failings. And the worst of it was, he was always right, but his remedy was always the same. Do better tomorrow. We didn't because we couldn't. Then Mr. Law died and we remarried, this time to Mr. Grace. Our new husband, Jesus, comes home every evening and the house is a mess. The children are being naughty. Dinner is burning on the stove. And we have even had other men in the house during the day. Still, he sweeps us into his arms and says, I love you. I choose you. I died for you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And our hearts melt. We don't understand such love. We expect him to despise us and reject us and humiliate us. But he treats us so well. We are so glad to belong to him now and forever. And we long to be fully pleasing to him. So the question you get to ask yourself is, who are you married to today? Or maybe even this moment. The truth is, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're married to Christ. But when you let the sin nature bully you into doing things that it wants to do, then we become married to Mr. Law. But we're dead to the law. And so we have to make a decision about who we're going to be married to. The key is trusting in Jesus, trusting him to do as he promised. And when we do that, he becomes that loving husband of grace who takes us through all kinds of things and allows us to have joy and happiness in our lives. I hope you're married to grace today. Thanks for listening.